Bibles and go back there to Proverbs chapter 29. And we're going to be looking at one verse tonight. And it is that blessed little verse that has provided so much inspiration and so much, uh, so many lessons and messages and speeches. But it is a great verse. And it helps us to refocus ourselves. We're talking about tonight the importance of a vision. Proverbs 29, and in verse 18, you have this verse. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. We're going to talk about having vision tonight, and the importance of having a vision. How many of you have ever heard of a man named Walt Disney? Would you raise your hand if you've heard of Walt Disney? If you've never heard of Walt Disney, then you ought to get out of your house occasionally. Walt Disney began his career as a cartoonist for a high school newspaper. And uh, as a young man, his first venture ended in bankruptcy. And then he moved to Kansas City and began his second enterprise, drawing con uh, cartoon strips and advertisements in a studio. When he found out that his career was not really taken off, he sold his camera, bought a one-way ticket to California, and headed out there. While he was going, he was dreaming up a cartoon character that was a mouse that he called Mortimer. His wife, suggesting that the name was far too serious and sophisticated, said, maybe you should just name him Mickey, Mickey Mouse. And the rest is history as we know it, right? He, his career takes off, the rest is history. One day, Disney took his daughter to a kid's park, and as his child was going round and round on a ride, he began to envision a place where parents and children could come together and have fun together. In 1955, Disneyland Dream became a reality, and they opened their park. And now their parks are operated in California, Florida, France, and Japan. Here's a man that had vision. One day, two fellows were walking through Disney, and one said to the other, he said, I wonder what Walt Disney would think if he saw all of this today. The other man turned and said, believe me, he saw it. He was a man of vision. He was someone who could see possibilities and see what could be down the road. And we have to be people of vision. Churches have to have vision. Uh, Helen Keller said this, uh, who was blind. She said, worse than being blind would be to be able to see and still have no vision. And there are many people who have vision but are blind, have, have actual vision but no vision in their heart and in their mind. And so we have to be people of vision. The poorest man in all the world is not the man that's without a, a dollar, but a man who's without a dream. We have to have some vision. Uh, William Carey, the great missionary, said, attempt great things for God and then expect th great things from God. And I want to tell you something. Our churches today are struggling because churches don't have any vision. And churches don't have any vision because they have pastors who don't have any vision. And they don't have any fit vision because they have no faith. They haven't seen what God can do. They haven't stepped out and seen what God can do to bless their church. And the bottom of the ladder is crowded with people who cannot see any further than the end of their nose. They have no vision. And I want us to be people of vision. I want to be a person of vision. I don't want to be a naysayer. I don't want to be a detractor. I don't want to be someone who is small-minded, who thinks small. Because uh, Brother West said how we think is in relative uh, to how we think about our God, how big our God is. If our vision is small, then it means in our minds our God is small. And so I want to be a person of vision. I want us to have deacons who have vision. I want us to have teachers who have vision. I want us to have directors and church members who have vision. Here's what I don't want. I don't want for me to have a vision. I don't want for our staff to have a vision. I don't want for our deacons to have a vision. I want for our church to have a vision. It can't be my vision. It has to be our vision. And where there is no vision, the people perish. Now I want us to think about a couple of things tonight in regards to the importance of having vision. Think first of all about the possibilities that challenge us. The wise man Solomon speaks here of vision. The very thought of vision implies 
the thought of future possibilities. To have a vision speaks of looking at things as they are, but seeing things as they could be. Not just seeing things for what they are, but seeing them for what they could be. Vision says, I, I can look at a young man, and I see a young man, but I see a great man that he could be someday. Some, a, a vision says, I look at a church, and I see a small church that's struggling, but I see what the church could be. I think about Paul Chapel, the pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church in Lancaster, California. What an amazing place. What an amazing place. You know how he became the pastor of that church? He was wandering through on vacation or going somewhere and just happened to stop in and they needed someone to preach and they had asked him to preach, to stop by just to fill in for their little church there and preach. And he preached and when he got done preaching, they voted to call him as pastor. He, he said, no way. There was about 12 people in the middle of the desert in California, 12 people in a little dinky building. And if you saw the pictures, it would blow your mind to see what they are today and what they were in 1986. He got in his car, he and his wife, and they were driving away. He said, it, it wouldn't, he said, the Holy Spirit would not leave me alone in regards to this church and what this church could someday be. And Paul Chapel ends up going back and pastoring that church in Lancaster, California. Today, one of the largest churches probably in America, the congregation runs about five to 6,000 people on Sunday mornings in the middle of the desert. And you go there, and Brother West and I flew out there in 2008, and we rented a car, and we're driving to their spiritual leadership conference, and, and it's, it's just desert. It's desert, and it's near Los Angeles, which is, you know, that is the, that's the end of the world as far as I'm concerned. And, and we're driving out through there, and it's desert. And Brother West said, you're telling me that somewhere out here is an 80-acre campus? where people can come to church and your kids can go to school in this church from kindergarten all the way through high school and there's a Bible college there. There's a five, 6,000 member church. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the desert, this oasis arises. And you see this amazing, amazing place. And I, I, I can't help but think about Paul Chapel who drove through Lancaster, California 30 years ago and saw this little church with 12 people and said, someday something great could be here. That is vision, friends. That's what it means to see things as they are, but see things for what they could be down the road. That is the very definition of vision. And here's a man, he said, I, I, all I did was grab a King James Bible and tuck it under my arm and get a pocket full of gospel tracts and begin to preach the gospel in Lancaster, California 30 years later, wow, how God has blessed. So these are the possibilities that challenge us to see things potentially. Do you do that? Do you see things potentially? Do you look and say, you know what, this could be great. This could be something, this person could be great. Our church could be great. Our Sunday school class could be great. Do you see things positively and prospectively? Vision enables us to see possibilities and so what are the possibilities that we're talking about number one there's the possibility of a greater work for God a greater work for God are we doing all that we can do I think that's a great question and the answer is no and you say well are we even doing enough the answer will always be no we're never doing enough. It's never going to be enough. There is an opportunity. Do you want to be used of the Lord as much as you could possibly be used? Do you want to do all that you can for the cause of Christ? I can't help but think about the Apostle Paul, who said, I am ready to spend, and listen, and to be spent, to be uh, exhausted for the cause of Jesus Christ, to do more. There is a possibility of a greater work for God. There is still more to do. Uh, a, a survey was done, and it was asked of the pastors, are you satisfied with the overall ministry of your church? One out of five pastors was satisfied somewhat or somewhat satisfied with the ministries that they do. Now, in some senses, we should be content, but there are some areas where we should never be satisfied. And serving the Lord Jesus Christ and doing a greater work is one of those areas. 
We should never be satisfied with where we are. There can always be a greater work. I mentioned this morning in my Sunday school class, uh, Dr. Curtis Hudson, one of the greatest soul winners of our time, who on his deathbed, he said, my greatest regret is that I have not done enough for my Lord Jesus Christ. And, and other pastors are going, Why, you're one of the greatest soul winners we've ever known. We don't know anybody who's tried harder to win people to Jesus Christ. And yet here's a man who as he's approaching the glory of God says, it still was not enough. That ought to be our attitude. There's a possibility of a greater work. Too many people are content with where they are. Secondly, there's the possibility of a glorious work by God. There's a greater work for God, but there's a possibility of a glorious work by God. A church that has vision not only sees what they can do for God, but, but check this out, but they see what God can do for them. You know, here's, here's the thing. Many of our churches never see mighty, marvelous, miraculous works by God because they don't have any vision. They don't have the faith to step out or they don't even have, uh, they don't have the, uh, the intentions to step out and be used in a way that God could bless and see mighty works done by God. We have to exercise faith and we have to be busy doing God's work in order to see his great miraculous blessings for our lives. I, think about this. Go, hold your place right there and go back to the book of Numbers with me. I want to take you back to a place where you're going to see two kinds of people. Go back to the book of Numbers. Hold your place in Proverbs chapter 29 and go back to the book of Numbers and look at chapter 13. Now, you guys all know this story. This is the passage of Scripture where the Israelites sent out spies into the land of Canaan. And I want to read this account to you. And you, you determine which group that you fall into. Look at verse 26 of chapter 13. It says, And they went out, they went and came to Moses and Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran, and to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. Now this is the promised land that they're supposed to go possess. And they told him and said, We came into the land... Whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit thereof. Now look here. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And, and moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now, there are two kind of people in this camp right here amongst these, these spies that went into the Canaan land. There is those who are positive and there are those who are pessimists. There are those who said, you know what? We can't see it. We can't possibly see how God is going to give us this land. We go there, and we see the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Parasites. And we can't possibly see how this is going to work. But then there's Caleb and there's Joshua who say, listen, we are well able to overcome. These are men who had vision. They could see the mighty works by God. We have to do a work for God in order to see the mighty works by God. And guess what? Of those 12 spies, only the two that had vision got to see the mighty work of God. The rest of them all perished right there in the desert. They all died right there. And so we're, they're going to kill us. Well, listen, you're going to die anyway. I got news for you. 10 out of 10 people die. That stat just came in. Ten out of ten people die. You're going to die anyway. I'd rather die in God's will, serving him, having faith and vision, than to die and perish with no vision at all. We'll never see, we'll never see mighty works by God until we do a mighty work for God. That's just how it's going to be. God's not going to bless uh, apathy and indifference. Number two, notice not only the possibilities that challenge us, notice the purpose that confronts us. The idea of a vision is, the knowledge, is that of knowledge and understanding. It is a revelation of God's plan and God's purpose. Some, one guy called it inspired guidance. 
It's when God guides your thoughts and your vision. Now, you know, I don't think you ought to be a daydreamer and necessarily dream up every stupid idea in the world. But we ought to ask God to give us some vision. And here's what I believe. I believe this with all my heart. That if God's people would ask God for vision, God would give it to them. God will give them vision, and then what God demands of us, God will supply for us. You think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was sent back by God to rebuild the walls of, of Jerusalem after they had been broken down and burned up, and it was in a reproach. His heart was saddened, and God put a vision in his heart to go back to Jerusalem, did he not? And the Bible says when he got there, that at nighttime he went out and took some men with him, and he said, neither told I any man what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. And he began to execute the vision that God had given him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Well, guess what? He needed supplies to rebuild the wall. And as he went, he went into the king's presence, and the king saw that he was sad, and it was against the law to be sad in the presence of the king. He said, why is your countenance fall? He said, why wouldn't it? My homeland lieth in waste. It's a reproach. It's a shame. He said, I want to go back and rebuild it. And the king said, you go back and you rebuild it. And then anything that you need, we'll give it to you. You need timber, you take it. You tell them that I said that you can have it. Listen, when, when people of God ask God for a vision, God will put something in their heart. And when he does, you say, well, that's too big. We can't do any of that. That's far greater than what we could ever do. Listen, God will supply what God demands. When he gives you a vision, he will give you the means to fulfill that vision. He won't ask you to do it. And the reason why so many churches never see it is because they don't want to. There are none so blind as them that will not see. And so we have to have a confrontation with our purpose here. There's a purpose that confronts us. And this deals with, uh, this is an indication of a desire in life, number one. It deals with our desire in life. Do you have a vision to understand what God wants you to do or what you can do, and to desire that it might be experienced and accomplished? Do you desire to see something accomplished? Do you have a vision? To have a vision is to hunger in your heart for what is above the ordinary. You know what's ordinary in America today? Sickly churches that are poor. The average church in America is going down. They're declining. The doors are closing everywhere. Even in the Bible Belt, churches are dying and closing. Pastors are quitting. I heard, was it, is it 1,500 pastors a, a month or a year that, that leave the ministry? Missionaries and pastors? The average church in America is weak and anemic and blind and ineffective having a vision is a hunger in your heart to see what is above the ordinary and God wants us to have that kind of vision the Bible says Jesus said blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled those who hunger for something shall be filled God said for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty we have to have vision. We have to have a desire in our heart to see something happen. When a church has a vision, they can see things. They see things as they can be, and they will possess a desire to see those things come to pass. But here's another step. Not only does it have to do with the desire in life, but it has to do with our direction in life, our direction for life. Having a vision puts into a, it puts into a life of a church, it gives it a reason to exist. It puts life into your church. Let me know why churches are anemic, why they struggle, because they have no purpose. Think about this. It, it only makes sense. People who have no purpose struggle, do they not? If people have no purpose in life, if they have no job, they have no family, they have, uh, they have no, nothing to drive them, those people fall into depression. They, they go into reclusion and they hide somewhere and they become depressed and we medicate those people and we think, well, you know, you can't help it. This is how they feel. Well, they have no purpose in life. People who have no purpose in life don't want to get out of bed. They want to lay in their bed, lay in their recliner, 
and those people just wither away and die. Well, listen, the same thing happens for churches too. If a church has no direction and has no purpose, then that church will just wither away and die. It'll become a depressing place. Listen, I've preached in churches that were less lively than nursing homes. That's true. I've preached in churches where all I could think about was I would like to shut my Bible and get off the stage and go out the door and get in my car and drive home. He said, well, that's not very nice, Brother Matt. It's just truth, and it's sad. He said, well, how do they get there? They have no purpose. They have no direction. <coughs> if we don't know where we're going, we'll probably end up somewhere else, won't we? One night before Karen and I moved to Tulsa, I shouldn't tell this story, but I will. Uh, I didn't know my way around in Tulsa very well, and we came up here in the daylight and went home in the dark. And uh, the, the roads in Tulsa kind of do this. And I thought I would have bet you a paycheck I was headed east on the BA Expressway, going to go down to Muskogee, take 69 Highway, and go back to where I came from, go back from whence I came. And I kept driving, and I'm driving. And if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else, right? And I'm driving, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, this stuff, this kind of looks similar to what I saw coming up, but it all looks so different. And they thing I know, I'm in Oolaga, Oklahoma. <laughs> and my wife's going, are you sure we're going the right direction? I said, I have no idea where I'm at. But I'm just going to keep, so we just turned around and drove back, and, and I realized where I went wrong, and uh, I took a wrong turn at Albuquerque, but... Um, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. Churches have to have direction. Jesus knew what he was doing when he was here. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh and no man works, and no man can work. When he stood before Pilate, he said, to this end was I born. What, to what end were you born? What is your life? I want to ask you. I, I want you to take a, a survey. What do you live for? What, what causes you to tick? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What drives your life? And let me ask you this question. Is what you're living for, is it worth Jesus dying for? That's a good question too. Because <laughs> sometimes we live for the wrong things. And maybe they're not worth Jesus dying for. Do you have a purpose in your life? Sadly, many people, their life is without meaning, without purpose, without reason. And he had no reason to get up. Listen to the words of Leonard Sweet. He said this. He said, the 20th century church is like a vehicle careening down the road at breakneck speed. He said, it really is somewhat of a danger to people. Everyone in the vehicle, talking about the 20th century church, everyone in the vehicle called the church is absolutely fixated on dome light issues. Fighting for who sits where, who gets the pillow, who gets the window seat, who gets to drive, who controls the radio? They have forgotten that the purpose of the car is to get to a certain destination. He said, we have become so fixated on dome lights that we have forgotten to even turn on the headlights. That's true. Churches have become so inward focused and what we want and what we desire. Many churches have forgotten their purpose for existing What's even sadder is that many people in the church have never even learned what the purpose of the church is. <laughs> I met a lady in a cafe one day. I was talking to Brother John Stein and I were having lunch, and this lady came up and started talking to us, and she was our waitress, and the cafe was so poor that there was nobody else in there. She had nothing else to do but to gripe to us about churches. Well, I don't like church. So we, she started talking to us. We started inviting her to church, talking to her. Well, I don't like to go to church. I don't, I don't go to church because uh, one time I, I had some needs and, and uh, this church would not help me, wouldn't help me pay my bills, wouldn't help me do this. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. What do you think the purpose of the church is? Do you think that the, the main purpose of the church is to help you with your bills? Well, yeah, to help people who are in need. I said, well, there's the problem. You've missed the whole purpose of the church. There was, a, there was a survey taken. Members of a thousand churches were surveyed and asked, why does the church exist? That's a good question. 89% said to take care of my needs and the needs of my family. 
Only 11% of members surveyed in 1,000 churches, only 11% of those people said that the purpose of the church is to win the world to Jesus Christ. Only 11%. You see the problem? The church, is, the church exists to meet my needs. Huh? No, it doesn't. The church exists as an avenue by where Christians who have vision can serve God in this world. It's a, it's a channel by which we get to serve together. It, it does meet some of our needs, but that's not its sole purpose. Its sole purpose was founded to win people to Jesus Christ. The pastor's responses were almost the exact opposite, 90% saying to win the lost and 10% saying to meet the needs of the members. You see, the purpose of the local church needs to be discovered by some and rediscovered by others. People forget. A vision puts all of that into our life. It gives us purpose as a church. Number three, and lastly, think about the peril that concerns us. There are possibilities that challenge us. There are, there's a purpose that confronts us, but there's a peril that should concern us. He says here in our text, where there is no vision, what happens? The people perish. Now there's the peril that should concern us. It's important that we have vision. It's important that our pastor be a man of vision. It's important that we be forward-thinking, that we think about the future and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because when there is no vision, the people perish. The churches perish. They fade away. I'll tell you one of the saddest revivals I ever preached. I'm not going to tell you where it was at, but it was a church in our work that back 30, 35 years ago was the largest church in our work in the state. And I go there, they had a seminary, they had a separate building that was a seminary, and I go there to preach, they have an auditorium that would seat about four or 500 people, all these extra buildings, and I got called to go preach at this church of revival. I was excited because I thought, man, I've never been to this church, but I, I've heard stories about how great this church was, you know. And I get down there, and I stand up before a congregation of 44 people. 44 people. The average age in that congregation was probably 75 to 80 WW2 veterans. And I thought to myself, what happened? Can, can you not help but wonder what happened? A church that used to run 400, 450, is maxed out. What happened? I want to tell you, though, I've preached in a lot of churches like that. I'll tell you what they do for me. They motivate me. I couldn't imagine coming in here someday and looking around and there only being 40 people in here. It'd break my heart. But I want to tell you something. It can happen. And it can happen very quickly. How? Have no vision. Uh, have a lack of vision. Have no faith. It's important because where there is no vision, the people perish. Think about the consequences of a lack of vision. Where there is no vision, we go backwards. The lack of vision is taps played over our future. It's the gravedigger's spade applied to our tomorrows. It is the death shroud wrapped around all that we can be and all that we can do. All we can do. Unless God's people have a clear understanding of where we're headed and what we're doing, we're going to have a lack of vision. We're going to have problems. We have to be moving forward. Here's one thing I have learned in church work. There is, there's no neutral in church work. There's no neutral. Now, we set some goals for our church. And we have been seeing God bless. Let me tell you what most churches would do right here. Are you ready? Most churches at this point, We'll just kick it up in neutral and coast. Well, you know what? Hey, God is blessed. We've almost reached all of our goals this year. It's only August. They would just throw it up in neutral, and they would just coast on out. But here's what happens. Here's the problem with that. There is no neutral. There's only forward and reverse. That's it. And if we're not growing, if we're not progressing, then we're dying. We're going backwards. And we're not going to see any growth. We're only going to see death and decay and department from our church. People leaving. 
There are consequences to having a lack of vision. Without a vision, church growth is hindered by man-made roadblocks. A lack of vision keeps us from reaching the heights that we can reach and doing all that we can do and being all that we can be and seeing all that we can see. Now, we started this year with some written goals. You want to know what they are? Some of you are probably not even aware of what they are. When we, we sat down and talked about this, we said, all right, we're going to have great vision this year. We're going to push hard. We're going to ask God to bless. And we sat down and we wrote out these goals and these ideas. And Brother West said, we ought to get up and read these in front of the people. The problem with getting up and telling you what our goals are <laughs> is now they're out there. And it's scary. Because what if we fail? But we did. We stood right here early January and we said, here's the goals. We're going to have a hundred editions this year. And I want to tell you something. When we said that, many people in this room right here said in their heart, will not happen. I promise you, they did. My heart was struggling to believe it and, 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 and lean toward it. Brother West said, we're going to have a hundred editions. And I, do you remember what I said to you, Brother West? I said, now go easy, Brother West. We don't want to set the goal so high that we fall woefully short and the people become discouraged. He said, oh, ye of little faith, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I took the rebuking and we're moving right along. It's August, we've had 82 editions. It's August. 82 editions. Two years ago, we averaged 215 in our Sunday morning service, 215. Last year, we averaged 228. We had a lot of Sundays where 240 or 250 would have been a dream, a great Sunday, a, a, day, to, a day to celebrate and rejoice. And this year, we got up and said, we're going to average 250 in our services this year. And God has been blessing. Through the month of July, we averaged 275. Last year in July, we averaged 201 in July for the whole month. That's a 74-person increase in average for that one month of July. And July is the hardest month because people are gone. We had 283 this morning, and I was mad. I was. I was mad. I was like, are you kidding me? We made ham. We made eight hams. Are you kidding me? 283? We always say if you cook it, they will come, right? Being goal-oriented is, is going to be key for a church. It's been estimated that 95% of people never write down any written, have any written goals for their life. And it's also estimated that the 5% who have written goals, 95% of them achieve those goals. In 1953, Yale University found that only 3% of their students had written specific goals for their, for their life. In 1975, they found that that 3% of those people had already achieved more than the other 97% combined. Why? Because they have vision. They said, here's our goals. Here's what, we, here's what we have, but here's what we could be. They see the potential, and they have something to strive for. People who have goals and vision are achievers. Churches who have no goals and no vision die. You say, well, our church didn't have, our, my home church way back then, they didn't have any vision. They're still alive. Listen, I want to tell you something. Most churches in Oklahoma are on life support. Just because they're still, there's still a heartbeat doesn't mean there's any life there. They're on life support. I don't want to be on life support. I want to see God do great things. Number two, think about the consequences of the loss of a vision. Some people in churches have never had a vision. Others had a vision and lost that vision. We all know of churches that used to thrive but now are dying and in some cases no longer exist. Why? Because they lost their vision. When they lost their vision, they lost their sight, they lost their purpose for existing. And when you lose your sight and lose your purpose, you're going to perish. You're going to perish. The lost will die and perish if we have no vision for reaching them with the gospel. See, our vision isn't just for us. Our vision is for the lost around us. Our vision needs to see 
needs to be able to see how God can bless this church by us going to the harvest. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We have to have vision to save lives out here. The people, the church is not only perish, but people around us are perishing if we have no vision. If we have no vision for the lost. Do you have a vision for the I want to ask you tonight, as our song leader comes and our piano players come, I want to ask you personally, yes, you, do you have a vision for this church? Do you have a vision for your neighbors, for your neighborhood? Do you have a vision for the people you work with or that you go to school with? Do you look at somebody and go, you know what, that guy could never be saved? Or do you look at that guy and say, this may be hard, but even this man can be touched by the Spirit of God. Do you have that kind of vision? If you don't, you need it. You say, well, how do I get it? You can pray. Ask God to give you vision. Open my eyes that I might see. Help me to see people. I pray for God to do this to me quite a bit. Help me to see people the way he sees them. Because sometimes I only see people the way that I see them. But God has to give me vision to see people for what they are, their souls. To give me vision to not shrink away from the, his greatness. You think about Joseph, he was a dreamer, wasn't he? He'd seen some things in a dream. And he told his brothers that these things were going to come to pass in his dream. And they mocked him, didn't they? They hated him because he was a dreamer. People may laugh at your dreams. But remember that the person that was, is without a dream never amounts to much of anything. We have to have vision may God give this church vision may he give us vision may he give you vision lost friend if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your savior do you have a purpose for living do you have a reason for your existence that's part of all of it right there is just to have a purpose in your life so you can have vision but you can have eternal life and you can have a purpose. God has a great purpose for your life. He'll give you eternal life. He'll give you great vision and great purpose. He'll give you a path in your life that you couldn't have given yourself if you had ten lifetimes to do it. Whatever your need is tonight, I invite you to come. Whether it's salvation, whether it's just obedience to Christ and in any, any area of your life. Or maybe... Maybe it's just that God would give you vision again. You say, oh, Brother Rains, I, my years are long spent. I have waxed old. And I have come and I have seen and I've done. Listen, those of you who have seen the most should have the greatest vision. <laughs> You've seen more than all of us. Some of you were standing here in this place right here. Brother Leroy Richards, probably one of them, standing here when this was a, a wide open field with nothing but grass. No homes. Some of you came over with South Lakewood when they came over here and there was nothing but grass here. There's no homes, no roads, no, no nothing. Brother Don Price and other men from the church stood here on this field and said there's going to be a great church here someday. Well, guess what? 44 years later, here it is. But she's not done. There's more. It's time for those who've seen that vision to share it with us and help us develop a new vision for the next 44 years should the Lord not come back. Where do we want to be next year? I'll tell you what this year's done for me. It's made me think about next year and the year after. And I can't wait to see what 2020 is going to be like. Would you share a vision with us? Would you pray and ask God to give it to you?